Looking for a stress-free summer? HelloFresh sends you foolproof step-by-step recipes and fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients to make mealtime a summer breeze. Get 16 free meals plus three free gifts with code AWFUL16. HelloFresh.com slash AWFUL16. And there's just enough air in the spare tire for Bond to stay underwater and pretend to be dead for the 10 seconds that they wait and check to make sure they're dead. Yeah. Hey, fuck you. Fuck you guys. I thought the tire air thing was sick. I feel like, is that even possible? I feel like the air. I don't give a fuck you, man. It's a fucking James Bond movie. <laughs> Let it be. Does the air just come out of the spare tire when you take the cap off? Probably. He's James Bond. Everything comes when he touches it. <laughs> Awful movie. 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 Welcome back to God Awful Movies, where each week we watch another terrible movie so you don't have to. I'm your host, Heath Enright, and I'm joined by the Eli Bosnick. Eli, how's it going? Hey, karate. Karate. It's going karate. Excellent answer. We also have veteran guest masochist. And the Karate Kid to Eli's Johnny Lawrence. Moishi is here. Moishi, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. And Moishi, you actually helped pick this movie. So why don't you tell us what are we going to be breaking down today and why, perhaps? So the first thing people need to know about me is that I am a huge James Bond fan. I've seen every movie multiple times. And today we are watching A View to a Kill. A simple story about a young horse trainer who just wants what we all want, really. Time for his hobbies, the approval of his father, a passionate romance, and an uncontested monopoly over the world's microchip supply by blowing up Silicon Valley or <laughs> flooding it or stealing all the fucking Something. crabs. I don't know. This movie was a piece of shit. <laughs> it's so bad, but it's good. <laughs> yeah, it's more one of those fucking things. Something, something in there. There's a plot, technically. And Eli, how bad, good, amazing bad was this movie? Well, if the ending of the last Bond film bummed you out and you'd like to comfort yourself with the knowledge that James Bond has been dead for a long, long time, you will love this movie. It's Reaganomics, the Bond movie. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's accurate. And is there anything you'd like to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah, I'll go first. This was without question the best worst shoehorning of a film's title into the script I have ever encountered in my life. <laughs> he might as well follow it up with, huh? Huh? I said the name of the movie. Yeah, and it's not even a kill. It's many kills. He's a terrorist. It doesn't make any sense. At best, it, it doesn't make sense. And they say it in front of the pilots who have no content. There's a lot to unpack there. We'll get to it. Sure yeah, is. the pilots are like, are you dropping a title or something of our lives? What's happening there? That didn't make sense. You said a view to a kill. I'm going to go with best worst assassination plot. So th- there's several things I could be talking about in this movie. So many. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna briefly name one. There is an assassination based on butterfly puppetry. Yep. That's all I'll say right now. Mm-hmm. And of course, I'm gonna go with best worst. What the fuck is this movie about now? Okay. So look, I get that all James Bond films follow the same plot. They're like, hey, here's this very obvious bad guy. Go do whatever rich guy thing he's into. Find out how that relates to the bad guyness of him and then kill him on top of a high object. And this movie follows that formula to a certain degree, except it loses its thread so many fucking times as to what this movie is about and what the bad guy might be doing. It's like they're trying to narrate a plot they came up with while they were drunk as they shoot it. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, though, that is a consistent problem in almost every Bond film. I have seen every Bond film probably three times. There are four I could tell you the bad guys like plan. Yep. <laughs> There's like fucking four because all the rest are like political Rube Goldberg devices. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they lose the plot and then we watch them in the movie like reconstruct yarn to put their plot back together <laughs> so fucking slowly. It's amazing. And they care so little that they don't even recap it, right? Like most complicated movies would be like, okay, so it was this, 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 and this at the end. 
And Bond movies never give a shit about that. They're just like, here's some pussy. He's going to have sex with now. Now he fucks her. <laughs> Fuck you. The end. Do you remember what we were doing here? Doesn't matter. Look yeah. at this little guy <laughs> fucking that kid. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of James Bond's very problematic sex life. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back to tell you all about A View to a Kill. Hi, I'm Moshe Schwartzbaum or whatever we decided my name is. And as a person with a Jewish name both on this show and in real life, I can personally tell you that a deep and abiding part of Jewish culture is therapy. That's right, Moshe. And there's no better way to get that therapy than better help. What's better help? Oh, come on. Heath, you're not even Jewish. Yeah, Non-Jewish people can have therapy too. Mm. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's affordable, financial aid is available, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Plus, god-awful movie listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash awful. That's BetterHelp.com slash awful. BetterHelp. Therapy when you need it whether or not you're Jewish. But especially if you're Jewish. Yeah, for sure, if you're Jewish. Man, I would sell my soul to make a great movie. Did someone say sell your soul? I can offer you power, money, fame. Wow, are you... Are you like Satan? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm Hagarius. I'm a, a minor demon from the fifth level of hell. Oh. What? What happened to Satan? I mean, I don't, I don't want to be the one to break it to you, but you don't have a particularly valuable soul, so this, this has gotten passed down the chain to me. I'm, I'm curious. Oh, got it. But you can still make me a great movie maker, right? Great? No, but I can make you a movie. Hey, how'd you like to work with Christopher Walken, huh? Oh. Fuck yeah, Christopher, he's a pretty good actor, I guess. Right? He's an actor, for sure, that you've heard of. And James Bond? Sean Connery? Nope. Mm -mm. Pierce Brosnan? Uh, I could do Roger Moore. But hey, it's not Timothy Dalton, right? So you would Roger Moore? Y yeah, I, I guess. I mean, a Bond movie with Christopher Walken sounds okay. Oh, who's the Bond girl? A literal child. Ew. Yeah, no, it's cool. It's like the 80s or whatever. Hey, super not cool at all. Uh, What about no. the uh, henchmen? Do I get like a cool and like odd job or Jaws? Oh, yeah. No, it is. Uh, it's a pretty cool henchman. It is Grace Jones, you know, the supermodel uh, with super strength. Like, like the model Grace Jones? Yep, with super strength. For my soul. For your soul, yeah. For your mortal soul. That's what you get. It's the 80s. Yeah, exactly. boy. And we're back. And we're going to start off the movie with a disclaimer. It says on the screen, neither the name Zorin nor any other name in this film is meant to portray a real company or actual person. And they had to, <laughs> they had to put this in because the movie forgot to do a trademark search. And there was a Zorin Corporation in real life that made microchips in real life. Oh, <laughs> no, they didn't. So they didn't make microchips. I looked into it. They made fashion. They were like a fashion design company. And the reason I found that surprising is because I legit like I've seen so many episodes of Law and Order. I forgot that those this is not based on real events warnings used to be sincere. Right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I'm so used to that being like a bullshit way to get around the fact that you so clearly just like stole the Anna Duvery story and put it on your fucking TV show that when I saw it on this movie, my first assumption was like, oh, I guess this entire film is based on a true story. <laughs> also on the screen for me right at the beginning was trivia from Amazon. And it says... <laughs> Roger Moore technically wasn't that much older than Grace Jones and Tanya Roberts, his two female co-stars. <laughs> and yeah, he was. He was he was noticeably older than both of them. Oh God, he's so old. He's so old that his opening you know that thing where Bond, like the thing focuses on him and then he quick draws to screen and shoots it? It's very clearly motivated by not hurting his back when Roger Moore <laughs> does it. He's like, gentle Roger, gentle. Remember what the doctor said? There we go. Gotcha. I'm James Bond. Yeah, he's looking old, but he's going to be Bond for today. So we open with two henchmen flying a helicopter somewhere in Russia. 
and Bond is there too. He's on skis and he's finding a dead body using a Walkman? Yeah. So every gadget, like pre-2000 movies, it seems, is just like a Walkman or a very yep. obviously like <laughs> rigged out flashlight they found. Yeah. yeah, I will say that like this almost got my best worst gadgets because every gadget in this movie is something we actually have here in the year of our Lord 2022, but 10 times smaller and better. Yeah, the gadgets are <laughs> fucking bad in this film. This is this yep. is not Bond at his best by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, right. And so so Bond is skiing, right? And then the guards chase him, right? Right. He steals this microchip thing, which is going to be important later, from the dead body of another spy. And then they have the ski chase. This British guy who is 108 years old is much better at skiing than a team of Russian ski commandos, of course. Yeah. So he's, he's getting away and then he steals a snowmobile, yeah. which turned out to be made of gasoline and he bails right before it blows up. But then he's snowboarding because it was 1985 and they got really excited about snowboarding being like an invention. And because there's only so much you can have somebody do on skis to make them look good at skiing, they have to make the Russian guards look really bad, right? And like for order for him to get away. And it looks like Every Russian guard in this film got their ski training from a vaudeville comedian. (laughs) They're legitimately doing pratfalls. They're doing pratfalls. That's correct. Absolutely. Watching these guys ski is like watching someone try to run on a banana peel in a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. Like their legs are creating dust clouds. They run into a pane of glass somehow. Yeah, it's ridiculous. (laughs) You can almost, if you like really focus, you can almost hear the sound of one of them going like, (laughs) you can hear the snare drum in the background <laughs> and he he goes over a, like a an icy lake but it's it's water for most of this and he's on a snowboard and that's the same thing as surfing on water so he goes right over it no problem and then the commandos on skis there's no such thing as water skis so they fall into the water and he, <laughs> he gets away the other fun fact i found in looking the scene up is that apparently snowboarding was so new at the time that the only stunt guy they could get to do the snowboarding scene was the guy who invented the snowboard. Yeah. Yes. Because it was so new, which to me is fun because that means like the conceit of the film is that, you know, occasionally in between saving the world and banging supermodels, James Bond just casually invents winter sports. Yep. <laughs> right. Cause like, like <laughs> snowboarding wasn't a thing yet. <laughs> yeah. So he, he makes it across the lake area and he gets to a British submarine. There's a little hatch that pops up with the British flag on it. And that submarine is wearing an, an iceberg to blend in like a lion hunter like with a, a pelt. Like a bad Halloween costume it spent too much time yeah, on. The, <laughs> the tag's still on it. But he jumps into the submarine and he gets away. And inside is a woman from 70s porn driving it who's also a spy for MI6, I guess. Okay, and this is the first and definitely not the last time that they will be like, all right, now you're going to kiss that super old dude because he's (laughs) sexy international spy James Bond. And you could just like actors didn't get good until 1992. So you could just see this actress being like, all right, here we go. Kissing 75 year old Roger Moore. Oh, God, you taste like Werther's. Oh, you taste like Werther's. (laughs) I also want to talk to like the MI6 engineer who designed the submarine that was custom built to be a fuck pad. Yeah. Right. <laughs> this, this government military submarine looks like it was designed based on the sketches of a strip club's VIP room. There's literally, <laughs> there's, there's no bedrooms. There's just a giant circular couch that rises up out of the floor. Mm-hmm. Is there yeah. a champagne room in this spy submarine? Yes, there is. Yeah. The whole thing is a champagne room. I've seen less obvious attempts to get people to fuck on a birthright trip. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, they sail away to Alaska to escape on autopilot and they they fuck for five days because it's James Bond. And now we get uh, a cut to the like beginning musical number. There's a glowy makeup lady dancing to Duran Duran playing the title song called... Not the title of the movie. It's called Dance Into the Fire, but in parentheses, A View to a Kill. Fun fact, this song literally broke up Duran Duran. <laughs> As well it should. It did. Yep. 
Also, we also learn here that the movie was produced by a guy named Broccoli, and that's the least silly thing about this movie. Yeah, the whole opening number looks like a pornographic music video shot in a laser tag arena. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Which sounds amazing. Can, can I tell you? I think it's because it was a pornographic <laughs> music video shot in a laser tag arena. <laughs> right. So they finished up the musical number. And now we're at the MI6 office in London. And Bond is checking in with Money Penny, who, of course, is trying to flirt with Bond. That's her thing. And I wanted it to go a little further. I wanted her to be like, hey, just so you know, I'm the only woman in this entire universe within three decades of your age. So <laughs> I'm your girl. Would you like to flirt with me or the queen? Because we are appropriate <laughs> ages for you to be flirting with Roger Moore. Child. And the answer was child for the rest of the movie. Yeah, yeah it's it's a consistent theme in the Bond films that the idea of him fucking this woman who is age appropriate is a self-evident punchline. <laughs> yeah, it's gross. <laughs> it's gross. So he walks into the office and we meet Q here too. Q is their invention guy, and he's playing with a really bad remote control car from 1985. I almost went with best worst Q invention because this Q invention will not matter until literally the very last scene of the movie. And it's a remote control car, I would say, seven or eight times the size of the one we have today. Yeah, it's it's terrible. Yeah, usually the movies start with like, Q kind of like casually introducing the thing that'll end up helping Bond save the day. And in this case, it just ends up being a stalker robot. Like it just, it just ends up being like Q's fucking porn goggles. <laughs> That's the entire thing. But we do learn the basis of the plot here. Q explains that he's got this microchip and this it's magnet proof. It's the most advanced microchip in the world. And the one that Bond recovered from the dead body is one of these new microchips and it was stolen by the KGB. So the KGB stole this advanced new microchip from a corporation called Zorin Corporation. And that's uh, that's going to be Christopher Walken. Yeah. So from there, now that we know the plot is something about microchips, we cut to a horse racing track. Yes, we do. <laughs> and <laughs> that makes sense. They're spying on Christopher Walken, on Zorin here at the track. Yeah, and by the way, the movie will be about horse racing for the next eh, 30 minutes. And if you're like, oh, wait, I must have missed something as they were talking about the movie just now. No, 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 no. We are we have accurately depicted the plot of this movie. They're like, hmm, yes, microchips from the Zorin Corporation. Quick to the horse races. Yep. <laughs> and we meet Grace Jones here. She's Mayday in this movie. She's his henchwoman. And she's doing spy stuff. She's wearing a bright red, like, avant-garde art dress thing with a As giant spies fez. often do, he. <laughs> really inconspicuous. In addition to being a spy slash assassin, she's also, I think, the horse whisperer for Zorin because Zorin owns horses. His horse wins this race. They speculate that he's cheating somehow with microchips that speed up horses and the, the horse that wins kind of freaks out for a second and Mayday whispers the horse. Yeah. This will not matter, but it's just a, a weird glimpse into her multi-job thing. I also love that when they introduce Mayday, you know, they're looking at her through the binoculars and Bond's like, who's that? And they're like, oh, she goes by Mayday. She's always with him. We're not sure what her job is. And I'm just like, you'd think they'd have learned after Odd Job and Goldfinger that if the name rhymes, they're definitely a henchman. Like, nobody's name in these movies ever rhymes that they're not going to be, like, throwing somebody off a bridge. Yeah. <laughs> I'd also like to point out two things about the Grace Jones character of Mayday. Okay. First of all, it's so fucking weird that it's Grace Jones. Like, this fashion slash supermodel slash black empowerment icon as a James Bond henchman. Right? It's not like fucking Jaws was played by, you know, an East German philosopher and Aja was played <laughs> by, like, you know, the prime minister of Japan. It's just an incredibly <laughs> culturally weird... If Bell Hooks was in Casino Royale, we'd be like, what the fuck is Bell Hooks doing in the middle of Casino Royale? But Grace Jones is just a super-powered supermodel who will do literally all the jobs for Christopher Walken. Correct. So what we learn here, it's it's about horses and microchips and Bond's boss at MI6 has a detective friend in France who's investigating Zorin at the time. 
So now Bond's going to go to France and meet with that detective to learn stuff about Zorin and horses and microchips. Cue James Bond, pet detective. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So Bond goes to the restaurant inside the Eiffel Tower to meet with the French detective guy whose name is Achilles Eggplant in French. Yeah. It's Achille Aubergine. Yeah. Now, you might think that's silly, but you got to remember this movie was produced by a guy whose last name is Broccoli. So for him, that was a totally normal name to have. Oh, you think they're just doing like a plant thing? Maybe. Hmm. Interesting. Well, this is where we get my best worst or part of it. There's a murder plot happening, and it's going to happen during Dominique and her enchanted butterfly act at the Eiffel Tower restaurant. Again, you might feel like you missed something. You didn't. <laughs> no, nope, I have not skipped any details. This is what happens. <laughs> we are relaying the order of actions in this movie, and we were as good. The, the only advantage is the movie never turned to us and was like, no, really, that's what fucking happens. Yep. <laughs> we had to keep going back on Amazon Prime to make sure we didn't black out for 26 <laughs> minutes. Yep. So this woman, Dominique, comes out on stage and starts whistling and dancing with butterfly puppets flying around in front of her. They're, they're on fishing poles from people backstage. And then we see one of those people dressed in all black with the fishing pole get karate chopped in the neck by, we learn, Mayday. And Mayday takes over doing the butterfly puppet thing. All of this is a ruse so that Mayday can murder the French detective under the cover of butterfly puppetry? Yes. She stabs him in the face with a butterfly puppet and he dies. <laughs> I feel like she made this plot way harder than it had to be. And look, in a cinematic universe that involves painting people's bodies to kill them, you know, fucking uh, just every, you know, squeezing people to death with your thighs in a, in a series that has had some <laughs> truly pulpy, and comical assassinations. I I cannot stress how far and away stupider this one is than all the rest. The yeah. puppet, <laughs> the pu it's <laughs> it's so bad. I I rewound it to make sure I wasn't fucking crazy because <laughs> she's dangling the butterfly puppet on the fishing pole, and I kept thinking to myself like, okay, clearly this they're setting up the assassination. Like you can tell where they're going with this. So like. How is she going to kill him with a butterfly on a fucking fishing string? And in my head, I was like, oh, I get it. She'll like somehow wrap it around his neck and like hang him. Which that would have done it. And I was like, if that happens, I'm going to be super fucking annoyed because that's fucking stupid. And then they do the other thing. And I was like, I really wish she'd hung him with the fishing ball. So much dumber. <laughs> It's a butterfly puppet neck dart that she like no. casts at his neck and it like no, it's, it's like a throwing star. No, 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 dude. It's just the hook from the butterfly, I think. Yeah. Like the butterflies are on these little hooks, right? So that they can sort of dance around and she lightly grazes him in the in the neck and he just dies. Oh, she she jugular veins him with the hook off the fishing pole? I think that's the implication, but it doesn't like she doesn't bleed out. Like, she just, like, lightly scratches his neck. I mean, if it was poison? And you see it stuck in his neck, and he just... I don't think it's poison. I don't think the implication is that it was poison. I'd love for them to imply it was poison. That would help a little. <laughs> so he... The guy dies, and his face lands in his soup. Mm -hmm. And Bond, you know, sees the assassin, and he goes to check on the guy. The guy just face plants in his soup. The thing hits him in his neck. He face plants into the soup. Bond checks his pulse to make sure he's dead. For all of two and a half seconds, like literally puts his fingers on the guy's neck, but does not take his face out of the soup. <laughs> nope. Mm -mm. Can't be bothered. Bond's just like he's dead. And like the guy could literally be in the soup being like, actually, I think it's just a flesh wound with some severe medical. <laughs> nope. Dead. Super dead. <laughs> Call it. <laughs> Makes his kill him and, and then doesn't help at all. Just and and doesn't even start chasing her. But rather than take this poor fucking guy's head out of his soup, goes, "There's a fly in his soup," and then chases me, which doesn't make sense. Oh, because butterfly. It's it wasn't a, butterfly. a fly. It's a fucking butterfly. And there's not and there's not a butterfly in his. Like even if if the butterfly was in his soup, that would be one thing. It was the they sat there and they were like, "Okay, butterfly kill." There's a 
fly. There's butter in his soup. No, that doesn't make sense no. either. <laughs> so now we get the chase scene on the fire escape of the Eiffel Tower. Bond's chasing Mayday. At one point, she catches him as if he is a fish with her butterfly puppet fishing pole. Oh. Also, it's so fucking clear that it's Mayday. It's so it's so obvious that it's Grace Jones because she's wearing like a ninja suit. Because it's Grace Jones. But she's also kept her giant vertical hat on under the ninja suit. <laughs> she has so those troops. <laughs> also, like, I'm just sorry to point it out. She's the only black person in the movie. And the mask only covers half her face. <laughs> yep. And they make eye contact. So it's, it's increases the whole thing is, is pretty useless. But yes, sorry, go on. Yeah, Grace Jones holding up a newspaper. It, that's Grace Jones with a newspaper. Like, you know what's happening. <laughs> That's a that's a woman who's so distinct looking, she's famous for it. Yep. She's a super model. <laughs> Literally, yes. <laughs> and Bond's like, I wonder who that mysterious enigma was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was the 80s. It was okay to call him that back then. <laughs> so, so Grace Jones slows him down with the, the fishing pole. Bond's like, I know it. That's, that's a fishing pole. That's really nothing. He pursues. <laughs> but she dives off the Eiffel Tower and parachutes away. So Bond runs back downstairs and he steals a cab and he chases her around Paris for a little bit. Yeah. But she lands on a riverboat that's having a wedding. And Zorin, Christopher Walken, is waiting right next to that riverboat with a speedboat to take her away. So I just want to be clear. The plan was to jump at the exact moment that she did and land on a moving boat and he would be right next to it. Was he invited to the wedding? <laughs> oh, maybe he got himself invited. So they get away in the boat and now we cut to James Bond getting yelled at by his boss for, I would imagine, killing a whole bunch of people in that ridiculous car chase with the cab. <laughs> yep. Also, they use the stunt guy again for the car chase scene and like... Whoever edited this movie was just like, I'm going to try to get as many close-ups of not Roger Moore's face as humanly <laughs> possible. And I, I can't stress enough, I look more like Roger Moore than he does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe they were thinking if they filmed enough of the stuntmen, they would just switch him out at the end and that would be the new Bond. <laughs> Roger Moore could be his grandpa that or something. would have been fantastic, but no. So we also learn here that Zorin is selling a bunch of thoroughbred horses at his horse castle nearby. So now Bond's going to go check that out. And Bond's going to pretend to be a wealthy horse guy who just shows up randomly named Sinjin Smythe. I just want to say I'm super confused why this horse auction is the plot of the movie now. <laughs> so is the movie, but they went with it. Yeah. So he shows up and the evil head of security for Zorin is... Being suspicious, but not enough. He's just like, yeah, well, we do allow random new guys to show up. I suppose that's you. Let's uh, let's give you the tour. <laughs> yeah, he shows up with a fake name. He's like, hello, I'm here to buy a horse at the horse auction because that's what this movie's about now. And the guy's like, well, that all tracks for me. You can stay in our bad guy lair unquestioned. Really quick, name a horse thing. Horse. All right, let's go. Let's do you it. You did it. You passed it. Yeah. What sound does a horse make? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Too slow. Well, well, let's yeah. go. Well, close fucking <laughs> yeah. enough. Close enough. Yeah, you got a 50. It's fine. It's like the driver's <laughs> test. Right. One other little detail. James Bond's chauffeur guy, but actually an MI6 guy named Tibbet, sneaks into the stables at this point, and he appears to steal a handful of horse shit, like, just to, to have it. This, this character, Tibbet, will do two things before he's killed. Spoiler alert. He will sneak around the stables, not finding very obvious bad guy stuff and being upset that he has to pretend to be a chauffeur. Yeah, and collecting horse shit. Yeah, but to be fair, Roger Moore spends 80% of this movie abusing Tibbet. <laughs> he does. That's true. Yeah, but a lot less than that because they have to kill Tibbet really soon. But yes, 80% of Tibbet on screen is just... Bond abusing him. God, is it really soon? It felt so fucking long from now. It's a long <laughs> movie. <laughs> it's a long ass fucking film. So Bond finishes up taking the tour of the horse auction stuff. And then later that day, he shows up at Zorin's chateau next to the horse area to meet with Zorin. And Bond is greeted by very clearly a Nazi equestrian themed porn star. Her name, her character's name in the real movie is Jenny Flex. Yep. 
Yeah, they literally named this girl Submission. Like the, <laughs> the subtlety, but also there's, I think there's some really good evidence in this scene for the theory that all James Bond movies are part of a shared continuity. Because when she tells him her name, he's like, I'll bet it is. Versus when Sean Connery finds out Pussy Galore's name and he goes, she's like, I'm Pussy Galore. And he's like, you must be joking. So I, it's got to be part of a shared continuity because clearly he was like surprised back then. And now he just assumes every woman's name is a sex pun. And he's just like, sure, why not? I'm fucking <laughs> Cox fucking McGee. <laughs> My name's Guys Fucks Kids. <laughs> it's German. <laughs> I wish Spider-Man was in this movie so we could get one of those like, oh, we're doing fake names moments. <laughs> fun fact, super not fun fact, this, Jenny Flex, is Allison Duty, that's her real name, who turned 18 during the filming of this movie. Is that true? Yep. Oh. They paired the oldest Bond with the youngest Bond girl. Great. Nice. Okay, let's just move on to the... Does he hook up with Jenny Flex? No. <laughs> No, I, I guarantee you he did not, because at some point, Grandpa Moore was like, I see, so you're one of the girls James will be seducing. And she was like, I like high school. And he was like, okay, it's the 80s, but fuck that. All right, <laughs> let's just fucking scene with her is over. We're going to... Dude, truly later on, there are some moments where Roger Moore looks like he doesn't want to do it. No, nobody wants to do it. This whole scene with her and him is just like, I don't like this. I actually don't like it either. Yeah, Roger Moore's come out and talked about it. Before he died, Roger Moore actually like commented on how uncomfortable he was with it in this film. I assume that was five minutes before the end of this movie. That's when he died. <laughs> yeah. <Sure>. <laughs> right, so Jenny Flex brings them into the chateau. They're going to stay there for the rest of the horse auction for the next few days. And they get shown to their room and they check the room for bugs and they find one. Security bugged every room so that they could listen to rich people say how much they'll pay for each horse so they can make more money at the auction. And this is where we get the dumbest spy thing. Bond and Tibbet put a, a Walkman on the table next to the bug they find. And it's a tape of them bickering with each other as if that's actually his chauffeur. And this is to trick security. Like they knew this was all going to happen. And they would need to trick security just so that they could walk out onto the balcony and and talk, which they could have done right. anyway. No one's ever bugged a balcony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which also means that in order to prepare for this mission, they were like, OK, great. Uh, James, we need you and Tibbet to get in this sound studio and record six and a half hours of bitchy horse, yeah. horse fighting. <laughs> <laughs> so now we cut to the reception for the horse auction. It's starting up. And Bond is just, he's very clearly spying on stuff. He's just walking around being like, spy, spy, spy. And Mayday, who's in charge of security for Zorin, is watching him. And she, like, does the eye thing, points at her eyes, points at his eyes. And she's like, you're clearly a spy. I'm going to try to murder you later. Yeah, I'm confused. She's personal security for the mansion as well as its butterfly assassin. She's wearing a lot of hats. Here. Yes, absolutely. And she's also literally wearing a lot of hats. A in this crazy movie. hat. Yeah, she's also yeah. wearing a lot of hats. Yeah. I also would like to point out that I think part of the reason Bond's able to get away with this is because it's a very loosely themed party. Yeah. There's like five guys dressed like the French Revolution, a geisha, because why the fuck not? <laughs> and everyone else just in fucking tuxedos. And why was Roger Moore wearing like a baked leather mask at the start? Wait, what? Oh my God, was that his face? Yeah, no, that was his face. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a bummer. <laughs> that's that's, <laughs> that's a Roger bummer Moore. That's Roger Moore. So yeah, <laughs> Bond at this point sneaks into one of Zorin's offices inside the chateau. And maybe you guys can explain what the fuck happened here. He He finds a checkbook in a drawer of a desk and then he uses a magic swipey thing that I imagine mm -hmm. like magicians have <laughs> and the swipey thing lets him see what the last check that Zorin wrote said. Yep. Makes an exact copy of the last check that was written on that checkbook. Okay. So in, in the movie, we're, we're just supposed to learn that $5 million was written as a check to somebody named S Sutton. But how would, how would the check go through that device and Great then pop question. out the back? Such a good question. That's actually a real spycraft thing. I know because because I like spycraft things. It's because of the impression on the next check under it from the pen. Wait, no, okay. I got that no. part. But how would the check physically go from the front of this flat, solid device to the back where he pulls it out from? Because uh, because spy stuff. 
Because spies. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. okay. I can explain it to you, but then I'd have to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> Moishi, Moishi, did you write this movie? You have to tell us. It's like being a cop. No. I'm a spy. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Bond finds this check. He's going to use this information later. And then he goes outside, and he goes to the bar, and he starts talking with Zorn. Zorn walks over, and Bond's like, cool, so uh, you're into horses. What about fishing? Are you into fishing poles? Butterfly, puppet murderer, whatever. <laughs> and Zorn's like, all right, I'm going to take off. Uh, I don't know, maybe uh, fuck one of these children at my party. Enjoy. These writers thought they nailed it so hard with the butterfly assassination that they felt compelled to remind us that it happened. <laughs> Do you remember that scene from earlier where we did that very clever thing we stole from an earlier Bond movie? Nailing it. And then, yes, as Zorn walks away, he says, like, why don't you go flirt with that literal child? Yeah, that, that was right. I didn't just make that up. That's what he says. Yeah, he literally is basically just like, a lot of young women here to fuck. Am I right, James? Am I right? <laughs> Have I introduced God. you to my friend Jeffrey Epstein? Yeah. It's gross. Yeah. I killed Natalie Wood. So, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Christopher Walken. Uh, may or may not have done that so bond does exactly what the evil villain just said he should do at this point and he walks over to a very young woman at this party to flirt with her okay so just to be clear this is allison duty right that's her real name she turned 18 during the filming of this the only scene in the movie that she participates in is this one where 78 billion year old roger moore walks over and is like hello what if we fucked and she'd be like i don't know i think that's illegal even now in 1984 when we're making this and he's like it sure the fuck is goodbye from the movie forever <laughs> <laughs> yep and then okay this was actually kind of good to mitigate all this terrible stuff we're talking about. At this moment, Mayday and Zorin see Bond flirting with this very young person. And <laughs> Zorin's like, hey, so that random guy that we let show up, he was being weird earlier. He very clearly referenced a murder that I just did with butterflies. I feel like that was suspicious. Keep an eye on him. And Mayday goes right over and rescues this very young woman from Bond. So yes. I, I was on Team Mayday and Zorn for the rest of the movie at this point. Yeah, I was totally Team Mayday here. She just walks over and she's like, hi, yeah, I know this is a Bond film and everything, but this is gross. I'm ending the scene now. I'm Grace Jones. Goodbye. Yeah, very important. This this made me a, a little bit happy about the terrible things that were happening. Also, can I just say that the like super strong Grace Jones supermodel, I really regret not having discovered this film earlier in my life. I kind of feel like this was Lady Dimiscu before Lady Dimiscu. I, I want Grace Jones to step on my neck, is what I'm saying. Sure. If she would be willing. Oh, man. Wait wait till I tell you about a little lady named Zenya Anatop from Goldeneye. No, I was... Well, I'm very Boy, well... do I have a surprise for you. Fun fact. No, there was a big awakening with Zenya Anatop. Believe me, I'm deeply aware of Zenya Anatop. I have a lot of unhealthy, okay. squeezing needs. Okay. Well, I don't know what the literary <laughs> reference you made exactly was, but I would like Grace Jones to step on my neck, probably. I, I like, regardless of what that was referencing. All right. So, bottom line, an assassin just prevented a sex crime by the protagonist, as far as we know. <laughs> so, well, we're going to need a quick break for a shower, and then we'll be back for Act Two of A View to a Kill. With a view to a kill. Some people will come up with any excuse not to exercise. Isn't that right, Moishi? I don't know what you're talking about. No? You didn't once try to get out of going to the gym by rescuing a hurt pigeon? Hold on, I didn't read this. Who put that real story in this <laughs> sketch? <laughs> I write all the sketches. <laughs> it's me. For the listeners, this is a true story, and f*** you, he needed help. Mm, sure he did. Well, now there's FitBod. FitBod's smart workout app gives you the custom tailored workouts you need to keep the burn going all summer long wherever you go. So no need to pretend you care about birds to get out of the it. The bird, I have witnesses. He had a broken wing and he lived two more weeks at the bird sanctuary on the Upper West Side. Mm -hmm. And have you ever rescued a bird before or since that moment? Yes. <laughs> no, you do not. <laughs> do you have a pet bird? Yes. <laughs> no, you do not. FitBod's smart workout app creates a custom dynamic program based on your goals, experience, and equipment. Their algorithm uses data and analytics to build your next best workout and maximize your results. Every workout is scientifically proven to be better than the last. FitBod tracks your recovery and varies up your routine to avoid overtraining. 
See your muscle usage, recovery, achievements, and workout streaks right in the app, guaranteeing that your workout goals won't die as instantly as that bird did when Moishi took a $200 Uber to a bird sanctuary uptown. It was, they were extremely helpful, and I will not disparage <laughs> it as your, as your script demands me to. They were extremely helpful, and I highly recommend the bird sanctuary on the Upper West Side. Crush your summer fitness goals with personalized workouts from FitPod that improve as you do. Get 25% off your subscription or try the app for free when you sign up now at fitpod.me slash gam. That's 25% off your subscription or try it for free at fitpod.me slash gam. FitPod, don't be the worst like Moishi. <laughs> Hello, you wanted to see me, comrades. Yes, Mr. Zorin, come in. Uh, you remember Comrade Skints? Hello. Uh, of course, of course. How can I help you, gentlemen? Right, so first of all, we just want to say that we're very excited for all the bad guy stuff you're doing for us. The horse thing? Super great, really. Oh, wow. Wow, so nice of you to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but it, we want to talk to you about your murders. My murders? Ah. Uh, What's the problem? They're a little, um, how do we put this, uh, convoluted. Exactly, yes. Convoluted, really? How? Okay, so like the other day with the horse racing guy, you assassinated him with a poison butterfly on a fishing pole. Well, that, that was the theme uh, of the performance on stage. The perfect crime. No, no it, it really wasn't. He screamed and then your assassin ran away and had big chase. Yeah, you could have just shot him with a gun. Yeah, speaking of which, the next day you tried to kill James Bond with a what a booby-trapped horse track. He escaped? Bastard. Right, but again, you could have just shot him with a gun. The gun. It's not, it's not like the right. cops were going to show up and be like, oh, this looks like a normal booby-trapped horse race death to me, you know, right, so just the, use a gun. But the tension... It's all about the tension. Literally no tension, man. No tension. At any moment, he could have just stopped riding his horse. Honestly, I would have stopped riding the horse. You're super lucky he didn't do that. All right. All right, gentlemen. I, I can see my work. It uh, displeases you. Perhaps you'd like to step outside so I can uh, apologize to you. Do you have a super convoluted way of killing us outside that only works if you have total social agreement? Nah. He totally does. He totally does. I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back. James Bond just got heroically cock-blocked. And Tibbet, the chauffeur guy, is in the stables getting more shit for his collection, I guess. He, I, he's claiming he's doing spy stuff, but I think he's just collecting shit. Okay, so what he's looking for at this point is, and we didn't talk about this scene because it didn't matter, the horse, the winning horse from earlier in the race that they think is cheating disappeared when Tibbet went in there to look for it. So now he's looking for where the horse went. Okay, got it. So whatever, they're checking out the stables and James was already in there actually and he found a secret elevator that goes to a basement that's full of evil science-y stuff, which it includes, there's a radioactive sign on a door in this basement to like some area and that door is open which I think yes it is <laughs> I just want to point out how absolutely fucking lucky of a break it was for Bond that the horse stuff turned out to be at all related to the microchip stuff yep. yeah like what if they just found like a regular horse steroid lab <laughs> right <laughs> you know? it's like well I'm going to be honest with you guys I really thought this was going to pan out <laughs> Em, I've got some great news. I've discovered that Zorin is cheating at horse racing. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shit, Silicon Valley's underwater. <laughs> <laughs> right. So they check out this evil science lab and they find out that the microchip thing, that's, the microchip is in the horse and it's controlling an injection of steroids at the right time during the race. So that's how Zorin might be cheating in horse racing. None of that really matters. At this point, some henchmen are coming into the secret basement. So... So Bond and Tibbet have to sneak away to a different area of the evil basement. That's the T-shirt I want to sell for this episode. None of that really matters. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway. Yeah, we're just we're going to get a henchman fight now. Yeah. They start fighting and it's very silly. OK, now question about this henchman, because he 
you have an amazing description of one of these henchmen in your notes, but I need to know, was this henchman literally Rob Reiner? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. That's Rob Reiner. It's this when you have henchmen and you're going to have a fist fight with them, you kind of need them to be, you know, big and imposing and scary. Rob Reiner, I guess, is big-ish, but like... But jolly. He's jolly big. I'm talking old Rob Reiner, not like Mikey Rob Reiner from All in the Family when he was, you know, athletic looking relatively. It's old Rob Reiner. No, no, no. It's Rob Reiner as you remember him from yesterday. Like, (laughs) it's Rob Reiner from 2022 to the point where I had to recheck how, like, what year this movie came out. Because I severely overestimated the amount of time it took for Rob Reiner to start looking like the Rob Reiner we now know. (laughs) (laughs) I assumed there was like 30 years of slow aging between when All in the Family ended and the time he like appeared on Bill Maher. Mm -mm. But it turns out that the moment that series ended, he just like ran around the sun three times. (laughs) Yep. No, he just he saw a ghost the day it ended and just all the hair fell out and everything else turned white. (laughs) Right. So... Bond and Tibbet fight the henchmen, one of them being old Rob Reiner. And they're in the uh, the packaging line area of this secret basement. Like, why would why would Zorin's microchip company have a packaging line in a secret basement for horse steroids all together in a chateau in France? No idea. Great question. But Bond beats up old Rob Reiner and like. Throws him on the packaging line and then the packaging thing like puts him in a box and then sends it to the assembly line. Yeah, they're trying to do the like, oh, look, James Bond is on a set piece and he's going to kill a bad guy with a set piece thing. But again, the cocaine levels of 1984 were way too high for anything imaginative. (laughs) So Rob Reiner's got to as painfully as possible, like very clearly roll onto the exact right spot of the thing and then... (laughs) get into the machine and then it like kind of pushes on his tummy a little bit and James Bond is like that's all wrapped up uh, no I threw out my back cut Would you, let me <laughs> let me slowly step onto this assembly line thing yeah it makes no sense it's so stupid so now we get an amazing part of the movie I, I love this we get to watch Grace Jones teaching karate to Christopher Walken yeah. yeah. In the traditional Okinawan and karate uniform of a spandex jazzercise suit and leg warmers. <laughs> yeah, you would think that a thong based bikini would be a disadvantage in karate, but I guess not. <laughs> well, either way, we get to watch Grace Jones pretend that Christopher Walken might be able to sometimes beat her at wrestling. So <laughs> we get that. They also have a sexual thing going on. So they kind of start making out at the end of their karate fight wrestle. Yep. I think at this point, Grace Jones was just relieved that she didn't have to make out with Roger Moore, right? Everyone else was like having to, I sure hope his teeth stay in his mouth while I was kissing him. And Christopher Walken was a breath of fresh air by comparison. Right. So they're doing their karate and then Walken gets a call from security and the security guy's like, hey, boss, one of our guards, one of our henchmen was in a box on the assembly line. I think we have intruders or something. So. Zorin and Grace Jones, they go to check on Sinjin Smythe, James Bond, in the chateau. Yeah. And they don't really have a reason why they think it's Sinjin Smythe. They're just like, well, that's that's James Bond, so let's check his room. <laughs> yeah. And I guess James got back to his room just fast enough, so when Mayday walks in, he's he's laying in bed naked, and he, go, he goes for like a weird power move, and he's just like, hello, Mayday, I, I've been fluffing for an hour. Let's do this. Yes. His distraction is, ah, I assume you're here to have sex with me. (laughs) And Christopher Walken is like, I mean, it might be awkward to come up with another reason why we're in his room. I guess you have to fuck him, my sexual partner we just established in the last scene and head henchman. And Grace Jones is like, yeah, I guess I'll fuck Roger Moore yeah. too. Damn it, I thought I was getting out of this. All right, listen, babe. It's either say wrong room and walk out or suck his dick. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't think the first one's going to fly. I love the moment. So walking is like, he's like, yeah, I got to give got to give Bond credit on this. You got to commit to this bit. That's a really good play. Fuck. And he just walks away. So. And he gives, he gives like a not bad shrug. Yeah, right. <laughs> so he walks away and, and Grace Jones and Roger Moore ha- have sex now. Roger Moore getting to make out with Grace Jones is the chief injustice of the 80s. <laughs> 
So anyway, we cut to the next morning and Bond's meeting with Zorin in Zorin's office. And Zorin's like, hey, uh, so how was your, your sleep? Knowing that Bond had sex with his karate girlfriend. And, and Bond does try, but he tries to do a double entendre Bond sex thing. And he's like, I nodded. Uh, I, I was up and I fucked your lady friend. I fu- we fucked each other. I had sex with her. Yeah. As you noticed. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it was quite swell. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. See, just think for another couple seconds. There you go. So the whole point of the scene is that Zorin is going to claim he has a computer that has all the horse info and he's still pretending that this is Sinjin Smythe, so he's going to help him buy a horse at the auction with his horse computer. It's actually a computer from 1985. It's, it's like a Commodore 64 that takes a picture of Bond and immediately tells Zorin that he's looking at a spy from MI6 named James Bond. Yeah, but again, this is computers from the year 1984, so Noah should be showing it off alongside like another different old Nintendo. So everything is like a single pixel, and it's like, that pixel's James Bond. (laughs) Right. So Zora's like, all right, well, cool, horses. Let's go riding, since we're both real horse people. This is real, and Bond's like, I I would love to. Let's actually, yes, let's horse ride together. (laughs) So Bond puts on his riding stuff that he brought in case this would happen and he goes he tells Tibbet to drive into town and have MI6 run a trace on that check for five million dollars he found what I love about this scene is that Tibbet is washing the car like scrubbing down the Rolls Royce that because like he's disappeared so far into the role of Tibbet you know what I mean like (laughs) he's not really Bond chauffeur he's an MI6 agent like I don't understand why he couldn't just be back in their hotel room (laughs) and simply folding the laundry or something like he's just, but he's, he's become so acclimated to Bond's abuse that he no longer remembers what freedom feels like. And Sir Godfrey is no more and Tibbet is all that remains. (laughs) Maybe there was a bug on the car too. So he had to go next to the bug and be like, we didn't make a tape for me washing the car. So he's like, wash, wash. I'm a normal chauffeur. This is real. Maybe they're tricking security. I don't know. So they're going to go on a horse ride together. That's the point here. A high intensity bond themed horse ride, everybody. Horse ride. That's correct. We see the bad guys put a steroid microchip remote control thing into Zorin's jockey whip that he's going to use. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that a remote control is going to shoot a drug into the horse they're going to give to bond. And that's going to make the horse go crazy and kill James Bond. Oh, Keith, I'm sorry. It's actually so much dumber than that. As you'll remember, the horse track is booby trapped. So the (laughs) remote control horse steroid is just in case there four different kinds of horse based booby traps don't work on him. (laughs) It's a fail safe, you see. Got it. Which is ridiculous because everyone knows a horse riding accident isn't how you kill James Bond. It's how you kill Superman. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Christopher Reeve. Good, Good stuff. Do you guys know the opposite of Christopher Reeves? What's that? Don't. Christopher Walken. Don't do it. Oh, my God. Oh, adroit. Adroit for this episode. (laughs) One other detail here. We also see that Mayday had Jenny Flex follow Tibbet into town when he was supposed to leave because they're suspicious. And we watch Tibbet show up at a car wash to cover his base and, you know, cover his lie. So he goes through the car wash and then we watch him getting strangled to death inside the car during the car wash. So like somehow yep. Mayday or, or Jenny Flex snuck into the car during the car wash and they kill him. So now Tibbet is dead. Mm-hmm. So we cut back to the horse riding and they're, they're going to do a steeplechase race against each other. Right. And there's some extra horse henchmen that are there to just beat up Bond. They've got the traps set up on the steeplechase stuff. It's all remote control because in 1985, they were like, what's the future of villainry? Probably a remote control stuff. Remotes it's, are awesome. I wanted it to work like remotes work in 1985, though, where like you got to stand right next to the trap and like, no, hold it upside down. <laughs> hold it up. Check the battery. Take the batteries out, switch them around opposite sides, and then put them back in, and then it'll do the. Do we have trap. D's? Who has D? Ah, okay. <laughs> We're just gonna have to plug it in. I need nine C batteries and a watch battery. <laughs> Much more importantly, why does the horse track exist? Like, 
Why does he have a booby trapped horse track? Like, uh, for the people who didn't see the movie, like, the fucking barriers get higher and lower out of nowhere, and there's, like, a fake hedge that all of a sudden pops up and shit. And, like, when Bond's not there, does Zorin just make his henchmen, like, race him and fuck with them? (laughs) Yes, he does. What if this didn't work? What if he had been like, all right, Mr. Bond, we're going to race horses for the way to win. And Bond had just been like, oh, no, thank you. Please. Oh, please. I got to tell you, in the pantheon of Bond movie dick measuring contests that includes like a swashbuckling sword fight and a custom built funhouse operated by a tiny slave. (laughs) This one is without a doubt the one in this movie. Yep, it sure is. Right, so they do the race. The the traps on the remote controls don't really work because Bond's that good and he gets ahead of Christopher Walken. And then we get the make the horse crazy backup plan with the remote control. So the horse gets an injection of crazy steroids that's going to make the horse run into the woods. But Bond guides the now crazy horse to run right next to Tibbet's car that he sees driving by at the perfect time. But, of course, Mayday is inside that car with the gun drawn because she had just killed Tibbet. Okay, so if I can just, in my head, flash cut to the fucking boardroom where Christopher Walken is planning this out. He was like, Mayday, you go into town and murder Tibbet. I will fail to kill him with a series of booby traps and also a horse steroid. But it will drive him near enough to your vehicle that you can use the gun that all of us have at any moments available to us to knock him out and put him in the car. What if if we have, we we run the horse next to a riverboat that has a wedding and it jumps on. Oh no, we already did that. That, Okay, You used that one already. I also just love, I love how persistent this trope is in all cinema pre- I don't know the year. Was it the fucking Matrix? Like, what was the point where people stopped being knocked out in films by a hit to the shoulder blade? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, do it. It, it, it's a consistent thing in every movie up to like 1997 where if you just like, if you just kind of lightly tap somebody on their shoulder blade with the butt of a gun, they just go to sleep. <laughs> do you think anybody ever tried it and the other guy was just like, ow. Ow, ow, ow. that's right in my, ow, right ow. my shoulder. <laughs> now I'm going to murder you. I, you know I have a bad back. <laughs> No, it's a bruise. Great. I can't even reach it. <laughs> right. So anyway, they they stop Bond. He's off the horse. He tries to get into the car. It's Mayday inside. They all pull guns and reveal that they know he's James Bond. They hit Bond on the back of the shoulders, knock him out, throw him in the back of the car, and they drive the car next to a lake, and then they roll the, the car with Tibbet and Bond unconscious inside into the lake. That's supposed to kill him. Oh, my God. This is like the ADHD guide to killing James Bond. It's just, okay, well, we'll just push him into the lake and I'm sure it's fine. I'm going to go on to my next activity now. Yeah. In the event that the obstacle course does not kill him. (laughs) But of course, they wake up from being submerged in water all of a sudden. And there's just enough air in the spare tire for bond to stay underwater and pretend to be dead for the 10 seconds that they wait and check to make sure they're dead yeah hey fuck you fuck you guys i thought the tire air thing was sick i feel like is that even possible i feel like the air i don't give a fuck you man it's a fucking james bond movie (laughs) let it be does the air just come out of the spare tire when you take the cap off Probably. He's James Bond. Everything comes when he touches it. (laughs) Yeah, it's fair. That's fair. Excellent point. That is canon. All right. So Bond's not dead. They think he's dead. Now we cut to Zorin watching horse practice at one of his horse tracks, and he meets with Russian General Gogol. And Gogol is apparently working with Zorin, and Gogol's mad about all the attention that's being attracted with the cheating and horse stuff and now killing a British spy. Because you know what this pointless, plotless movie needed? A subplot where the movie antagonist breaks up with his Russian spy dad. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Dude, Zoran just wanted to race horses and be with his interracial girlfriend, and dad doesn't like it. And I gotta tell (laughs) you, I think this is a classic story of mom and dad not supporting your hobbies or the fact that you brought home a black girl. All right? Exactly, yes. I am shipping... Political commentary. (laughs) I am shipping... Zorin Mayday. Yeah, good stuff. So Zorin's just just kind of mad. And he's like, yeah, I'm not a KGB agent anymore. I guess he used to be. And the KGB guys are like, that's that's not how it works. Yeah, you are. We get to do whatever <laughs> we want. 
And they had apparently trained and financed Zorin for some stuff he'd done in the past. At this point, Mayday sneaks up behind one of the bodyguards for General Gogol and just picks him up over her head and looks at everyone like, I picked this guy up. It's a standoff or something. I am carrying him. (laughs) Everybody pulls guns and it turns into a Mexican standoff. I think it would have been much funnier if everyone had picked someone else up. up, (laughs) You throw you, you put your guy down first. You put your guy down first. (laughs) I also, fun fact. So at this time, Dolph Lundgren was uh, Grace Jones's bodyguard. And she was like, hey, do you want to be in this scene where I pick a guy up? And he was like, yeah, sure. And that's Dolph Lundgren's first appearance in a movie. Really? Who's Dolph Lundgren? He's Ivan Drago, Ivan Drago in the Rocky, Rocky movies. Oh, uh, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> so so Mayday picks up the guy and they, they're like, yeah, okay. That's, that is a standoff. Whatever. We're the KGB. We're, uh, and General Google's like kind of mad. And he's just... All right, I'm going to leave then. I'm I'm still in the movie, though. And that's the end of the scene. Uh, I didn't know your bodyguard was going to lift one of my guys. It's going to wreck his Did not see that coming. Okay. We're leaving. You've won for now, Zorin, because of the picking up. So now we cut to a meeting at what seems to be Zorin HQ. Right. They're in like a conference room. And he's got a bunch of microchip CEOs that he's talking to about his new business plan. Yeah. He's going to he's going to tell us what the movie is about now (laughs) right it's so weird too he starts this big speech he's like alchemy is making lead into gold and microchips is making uh, microchips from from sand and 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 he has (laughs) he has sand as like a visual aid in a tupperware and he just like picks up a little bit of sand yeah he has two visual aids microchips and sand yeah (laughs) he hands out the microchips like he's passing around peanut m and m's just like anyone want a microchip (laughs) he's like he literally is just like microchips come from sand any questions (laughs) (laughs) that's it (laughs) yep so the whole point is this is supposed to be like an evil business plan but it's just at this point it's just a company that wants to make microchips (laughs) that's not evil right so for context, the, he lays out the whole basic plan, and and the plan is they're going. He wants to blow up Silicon Valley, right? And because all the people at this meeting, these are not criminals; these are the heads no. of different tech companies, foreign tech companies, who he has been like kind of you know cavorting with in order to like secure the market on microchips. And he's like, guys, what if I told you? we could have all the microchips by getting rid of Silicon Valley. And they're like, yeah, how are you going to do that? And he's like, here's my plan. We're going to blow up Silicon Valley. And because they're a bunch of like tech company CEOs, one of them is like, I don't like that idea. I think we should not do terrorism. And if you've ever (laughs) seen a Bond film before in your life, you know where this is going because every single Bond film has what I call the we appreciate your feedback scene. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's because this scene it, this scene is in every single Bond film. It's the scene where the villain gives a timeshare style pitch <laughs> to yep. all the other like villainy mainstreamy villain people, right? Like the the people who run the CD companies or the other crime syndicate guys or whatever. And one of them is like outrageous. And then the villain (laughs) is always like, Frank, I hear you. We appreciate your feedback. Put on us. Ejection (laughs) seat. Yeah, whatever. Every, every single time. Although the way they executed in this film, I think takes the cake. (laughs) Yeah. Right. One guy puts his hand up and he's like, I, I, I'm just a computer nerd. I don't think we should do terrorism and start a microchip cartel. We should just do the second thing at most. <laughs> and Walken's like, yeah, could you go ahead and wait outside? No, not to murder you. Just wait outside. And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. No problem. Yeah. Go with Mayday outside. It'll, it'll be fun. And Mayday's like, please walk down these stairs. Nothing's going to happen. He does it. And she turns the stairs into a very slippery ramp and he slides down the ramp and out of the blimp that they've been in the whole time. There are so many components to this that wouldn't have worked out. What if they got there and a guy was like, hey, can we actually not have the meeting on the blimp? What if they had gotten outside the room and she had been like, just head down those stairs and you'd been like, no, that's very obviously a blimp murder slide. What if someone inside the room had been like, hey, I'm sorry, I just heard a scream from four inches outside the door. Do you have a blimp murder slide? And no, I won't leave the building. So I have a, I have a million questions about this. 
Because again, again, in every other Bond film, the people in this like timeshare pit, like the evil timeshare meeting are always other crime syndicate leaders, right? It's like the scene from Dark Knight, right? Where the Joker with the fucking pencil. Yeah. But these are just like, he just murdered the head of Honda. Like, yeah, right. Fucking, it's like the fucking CEO of Samsung just got thrown out of a fucking blimp. <laughs> and, and what happened if they all dissented? Would he just like line them up in the hallway? <laughs> just one. Is it like when, it's like when everybody lines up in middle school at the top of the slide? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I, I, there, there's one guy left. I, I heard nine people in a row scream when you sent him outside nicely. I don't want to go outside. All right. Oh man. Right. Also, did he design this blimp? Because if he didn't, that means he had to like, when he was talking to his blimp guy, he had to be like, and I would like these stairs to turn into a slide unexpectedly and the guy was like is it for murder <laughs> no and yeah. I, I love how the guy the guy who's going to his death never sees it coming he's always like well I'm really glad I spoke up I feel like this is really gonna happen <gasps> yeah like if I ever get diagnosed with a terminal disease I'd like to commit suicide by vocally dissenting during a pitch meeting with a Bond villain <laughs> I feel like that would be a relatively painless quick way to go <laughs> also to be clear they all got onto a blimp, so they know they're in a blimp. Where did he think those stairs might go? To like an extra little, like a green room to just hang out? You'll be going to the rear blimp for the <laughs> nice to crafty yes. off the edge of the blimp. Yeah. Ooh, it's Taco Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> One other detail on this scene. Christopher Walken, Zorin, when he, he gives his speech and he's like, all right, we have to beat Silicon Valley. They have 80% of the microchip market. And at that moment, he presses a button and the big conference table opens up and a scale model of Silicon Valley, like a diorama, pops out of the table just so that he could, at that moment, have this impactful thing of this is Silicon Valley. It kind of looks like this. He will spend a whole bunch of money on stuff like this for the rest of the movie. Yeah. Probably buy more microchips if he didn't spend so much money on blimp customization. Yeah. <laughs> no wonder Silicon Valley has 80% of the market. <laughs> really want to be at the debriefing? Okay, so we only lost one person to the pitch. That was pretty great. I'm going to say it. I didn't think the table rising up Silicon Valley thing hit as hard, which sucks because that cost us like $6,000 to have someone make a scale model of Silicon Valley so that I could point to it and say Silicon Valley. <laughs> I thought people liked it. Yeah. So that meeting is over. The president of Honda is dead. That won't matter in the universe. <laughs> Never. And now the blimp arrives in San Francisco because they're going to murder all the microchips in Silicon Valley somehow. This is where we get Jason's best worst. Yeah. Where they come over the bridge and she goes, what a view. And he goes to a kill. Yeah. And they and they have to cut to the next scene. Because if they didn't, the next thing that would have happened would have been Grace Jones turning to Christopher Walken and just being like, what? <laughs> <laughs> it makes so, it, the, the sentence makes no sense because the titles all came from the Ian Fleming books, right? Right. Yeah. And the books were almost unanimously not used for the film plots. Like this one in particular has no resemblance to the book, right? Like I, if I recall correctly, and I might not, but I, if I recall correctly, like the book is sort of about like, the, the, the title references like somebody witnessing a murder, right? Like they have a view to a kill. Not like, I, I don't even know. I don't know what to say because the line <laughs> makes so little fucking sense. And it must have made even less sense to the pilots who just haven't been privy to all the murder sliding that's been going on. Right. <laughs> pilots are just like, you guys, you guys evil laugh a lot back here. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so they fly into San Francisco and we also see Bond in San Francisco he knew the plan was to murder all the microchips in Silicon Valley. So he went to San Francisco in general to do recon, I guess. And he shows up at a crab shack and he says to the guy at, <laughs> at the counter of the crab shack, I'd like some soft shell crabs. But apparently that was spy code for something. And that guy was a spy. You probably shouldn't make your spy code the thing people probably say to you a lot at the store you work at. Yeah. So many people must have been like ushered into the spy area of the back. And then <laughs> yeah. they were just like, no, I, what's happening? I want soft shell crabs. I wanted them to walk past a mountain of dead bodies. It's just like, you have no idea how many people <laughs> ask for soft shell crabs <laughs> at a crab shop. It turns out 
Fun fact, 50% of the crabs. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. They either want hard shell or soft shell crabs. So yeah, we had to kill a lot of people to keep this under wraps. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to make your undercover job Best Buy. And the secret spy code is going to be, do you guys have any PS5s in stock? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, either way, we learn from CIA operative guy. They start talking. We learn that the the Nazi doctor guy that I was joking about as being a Nazi doctor, he actually is literally a Nazi doctor. He did experiments with steroids on pregnant women in concentration camps, and it made some of the kids extra smart, but also psychotic. And yeah. Zorin is one of those kids. Yeah, it, it gave the kids, uh, to quote the movie precisely, higher than average IQs, which answers the age-old question, why do Jews have such high IQs? Yeah. Fun fact, this, that CIA agent would later go on to write a highly controversial book called The Bell Curve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think enough movies make the, well, what about the Nazi experiments that worked a plot point? <laughs> yeah, weird pick. Weird pick. That's what they went with, though. I also love that the CIA guy, when they first meet up, is like, you're James Bond, big fan. And Bond is just like, Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, fucking God, guy. I'm not, I don't really have a pen on me. I don't know how to. <laughs> you want me to fuck you? <laughs> it's usually what I do to fans. So, right. <laughs> right. So they, they finish talking about the Holocaust experiments of the doctor. And now Bond says, OK, tell me about Zorin's oil operation here in the United States. And CIA guy is like, oh, that's perfect. Uh, our walk and talk that we were having just now, it actually ended right next to my fisherman friend who knows oil information. He's right here. And that guy pops up out of nowhere and tells him that Zorin's oil station made all the crabs disappear, except for all the ones that we just saw at the crab market. I love that conversation, too, because he goes, the crabs have all gone. And Bond goes, did it scare them away? And the guy goes, no, they just disappeared. And my question is, how would those two things look different? <laughs> how does he know they weren't scared away that they've just disappeared like either that or they vanished i don't know <laughs> i'm just a crabber no they left no notes behind yeah. right. they didn't they didn't seem panicked when i last spoke to the crabs <laughs> they didn't mention anything about being afraid <laughs> so what is something crab related and suspicious with that oil station so bond is going to go check out zorin's oil rig thing. So that night, Bond gets into scuba gear and he swims up to Zorn's oil station to see what's going on. So the whole point of this scene is just to learn a little bit of information about Zorn's plan. We hear him say the main strike is in three days. And I guess that's the big thing when they're going to kill all the microchips. We also see Mayday catch a Russian spy who's also trying to mess with this oil rig at the same time as Bond. And the Russian spy was going to try to bomb it and also try to bug it and get information about Zorin's thing, too, because the KGB's mad at him now, I guess. Yeah, it's as though the Bond movie caught a different movie happening during its <laughs> movie and had to kill off their characters accordingly. Right. So they catch that one Russian spy guy. They don't catch Bond and they kill him in one of their fan turbines, whatever. Then we cut to the next day and Bond is pretending to be a reporter from London, and he's doing an interview with the California Director of Oil and Mines. Yeah, so just to be clear, if we're counting the fake names that James has gone with so far, they are St. James and now James. <laughs> yeah, he's James Stock here, because Stock yeah. Bond, it's, it's kind of James Dogecoin, whatever. <laughs> I feel like they were trying to make James Bond as bad at fake names a running thing, but they didn't have the courage to stick the landing. Right. My name is James Ethereum. Yeah, right. This scene doesn't particularly matter, but this is where Bond sees the very young woman that he met in France who stepped out of that helicopter. This is going to be Stacy Sutton, who got the $5 million check from Zorin. And he starts following her. He drives behind her for a while and they arrive at her fancy house that she must have bought with all that evil money she got. Oh, that's at least what Bond thinks. OK, I had no idea why he followed her, except that's where the rest of the movie takes place. <laughs> right. No, he thinks she's a suspicious character because he saw her at the evil horse thing. Oh, yeah. OK. And I'm going to investigate this house because that's where the script tells me to go. <laughs> yes. And that's exactly what he does. And it's kind of gross. Again, 
he walks right into her house. He, he actually breaks into the window with a sharper image card window unlocker. I don't know what that was. What was that a reference to? Who was that for? I know sharper image. It was for the money from sharper image. I'm guessing the massage chair kings of 1984 were like, guys, let's drop the dine heavily on Roger Moore's dying breath. Yep, that's what they, that's what they went with. I like the idea that Bond was just strolling around a um, sharper image, just making like witticisms about the vibrators all day. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, you're only supposed to try the massage chair once. You are only. I'm a. I have a license to kill. Get the fuck away from me. <laughs> so he sneaks into her house, and she's taking a shower now, and he's sneaking up on her. It's terrible, but it turns out she has the drop on him. She's hiding with a gun in the closet, and she pops out, and now she's got James stuck up. And there's there's this fantastic moment that happens in the movie. So a bunch of bad guys are about to break in. They're going to fight them off. But there's nowhere for the scene to go because she's got him. So she's like, you freeze right there. And he's like, bad guys are here so the movie can move forward. <laughs> yeah, right. Just <laughs> They're just instant allies. <laughs> Keep in mind that from her perspective, a man just snuck up on her with a weapon in the shower. But the fact that there are other men in the building, she's like, well, we're obviously on the same team, right? You're not on your you're team shower guy. You're just you're just a local shower pervert. These guys are out to hurt me. Yep. And that does allow the plot to go forward. Whatever. They have a fight, a gun slash very slow punching fight. Bond wins. Oh, my God. The stunt double is back. And let me tell you, he's less Roger Mori than ever. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and call this fight choreography old age home rumble. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty rough. Yeah. It's fucking brutal. It's just turn based, slow punching. Bond <laughs> does that faster than them. They all run away. Nobody gets killed. This team of henchmen just runs away. And that's the end of the scene. Except, oh, you forgot one part. You forgot the great part where Bond breaks the urn that's on the shelf. And then at the end of the fight, he comes back and he's like, I'm so sorry. Was this important? She was like, no, it was just grandpa. Yep. <laughs> Which, by the way, if you're wondering why she'll later end up having sex with a 79-year-old man, probably something to do with that relationship. <laughs> Very impossible. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, Bond's done slow fighting. We're going to take one more quick break to let Roger Moore catch his breath. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Will Crafty have a big enough pile of ACE inhibitors to get Roger Moore to the end? Will the actress who's playing that young woman turn 18 in time to, well, still be gross regardless for most of this movie and all the interactions with women? Will the finale happen so slowly that they literally hit the brakes in the movie at one point. <laughs> Find out that yes is the answer to all that when we return for the geologic time conclusion of A View to a Kill. Hey, Heath, what are you doing? Shh, I'm watching Moishi practice magic. Look at him. Look at him. He's like a tiny, beautiful David Copperfield. Heath, he's playing Candy Crush on his right, phone. Yeah, I know. But look at his dexterity. He's a master. Nope, no, nope, no, he is not. Look, Heath, if you want to learn things from a master, why don't you try Masterclass? Oh, what's Masterclass? With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn how to skateboard from Tony Hawk, improve your chess skills with Gary Gasparov, or learn magic from Penn & Teller. With over 100 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. Wait, did you say I can learn magic from Penn & Teller? You sure can. They even teach a trick that both Moshi and I use to open our shows, very unfortunately. Plus, you can access Masterclass from your smart TV, computer, or even your phone. Wow. I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every Masterclass, and as a God Awful Movies listener, you get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash awful now. That's masterclass.com slash awful for 15% off Masterclass. Nice. All right. Now, back to watching. Look, he's studying body language right now. He's flexing in front of a mirror. Which is a body. I think he's nailing it. <laughs> you wanted to see me. Yes, Bond, come in. Uh, hey, Eli? Keith, why are you beeping out of the sketch? I, I, I'm sorry, what's beeping out of the sketch? Not now, I just feel like we should acknowledge the voice thing. What voice thing? The voice that you're doing for M in the sketch. We need to acknowledge it is where my that came from. floon puff voice. Mm, yes. Right. 
but it's based on the M character from a super ego sketch. And now you're literally doing it in a sketch about James Bond. You can't copyright a voice. He, no, it's not I, like I, I know. Technically, I just feel like for anyone who listens, it would be good for us to acknowledge it right here. Okay, that, it's acknowledged. Are we acknowledging? Are we all acknowledged? Up? We're acknowledged up. Yes. Eli stole the voice for this sketch. Borrowed. Con- stolen. Continue. You wanted to see me. Yes, Bond. It's about your latest mission. Yes, I've tracked Zoran down. Indeed. It's just that it seems that you're not very good at giving fake names. Oh, I'm not. No, you seem to keep with the name James and then you just change the last name. And, you know, when you're a double O agent, we really prefer you change the whole thing. I see. Clever. So uh, p- perhaps Mames Smith would be nope, better suited. Mames. That's not a name. That's not a name, Mames. Mm, uh, uh, names Smith. Smith. Nope, names nope. Smith. Nope. Literally the word names is what you just said now. That's not a name. It is the word names. Perhaps Timothy. Excellent. Bond. Nope. You know what? It's fine. My name is James Bond. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And we're back. When we left off, James Bond had just finished fighting off some henchmen, and then he made a quiche for the two of them. So now he's trying to impress a way too young woman by cooking eggs. So now they're having quiche together at the house where a team of commandos just attacked them and left. And they think it's fine. (laughs) Also, Stacy is the name of this character. She changes into a cocktail dress to have quiche at her own house with James Bond. Yeah, you know, that's that's the least you could do when someone makes you, when someone defends you from henchmen and then makes you a quiche, you know, you want to dress up for the occasion. Dress nice. Okay. (laughs) So now we get her backstory a little bit. Zorin took over her family's oil business. She's now a geologist for the state of California. And Zorin gave her that $5 million check because he wanted to buy the shares of her company and make her drop the lawsuit that she had going against Zorin Industries. Yeah, but apparently he changed his mind in between writing her that check like five scenes ago and now because he just sent four henchmen to kill her. It's very (laughs) unclear what's going on here. Right. (laughs) And we learned that the henchmen cut the phone line to the house. So James is like, all right, I'll go reconnect the the phone line. And she tries to do some sexy talk that doesn't really work at all. She's like, oh, the phone, the phone box is outside my, my bedroom near, near my vagina sometimes. And this is, this is the least Roger Moore looks into it in the whole film. <laughs> She's like, the phone box is outside my bedroom. I can show you if you like. And he's like, I can, I can find it. I can find it. I'm okay. Don't you have to be in fucking class or something? <laughs> you have a toolbox? Yeah. I know your grandpa pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember Gunsmoke? <laughs> that was a show. <laughs> so we, see, we see Bond go outside and he just mashes wires and he's like, all right, I, ma- I mashed him. That's the phone's fixed. Cool. And then he goes back inside and she's asleep. And fortunately, he lets her just be asleep. And I was really happy about that. Yeah, we all had a very, our notes all turned this into a horror movie as 79 year old James Bond approaches the sleeping young woman. We were like, Oh no. Oh, these movies are problem. But no, it's okay. He just puts a blanket over. Yeah. He tucks her in, reads her a bedtime story, packs her lunch for school the next day. <laughs> and can I just say it's the most age appropriate interaction they have in the movie? Sure is. Sure the fuck is. So the next morning, Bond wakes up. And it turns out there was an earthquake right around them in California. And she gets on her earthquake computer, Apple 2C that she has. Mm-hmm. And looks, yep. she presses one button and the, the earthquake program pops up. And she's like, yep, two wavy green shapes that are pixelated. That's an earthquake. There you go. <laughs> and it turns out Zorin's oil station is right in the epicenter of that earthquake. So they talk about his plan a little bit. James mentions that Zorin was pumping seawater into his oil rig when James did the scuba expedition. Also, that's right on a fault line where he was pumping it. So she's like, yeah, he could cause an earthquake using the seawater. I don't don't know if that's actually a thing, but. This movie's villain plot requires such a nuanced understanding of like fucking sedimentary geology. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I don't know what they thought we were supposed to 
think or follow. Right. Yeah. There's always a weird moment in Jake, because this is, again, part of the James Bond formula is it's always like, oh, but don't you see, Mr. Bond, once I activate my drill, Mount St. Helens will explode. <laughs> right. But this movie, because it's so poorly written, is just like, OK, well, let me go over an entire fifth grade science textbook with you for this bullshit science we made up for our movie. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess we're supposed to learn that the plan that Zoran has is to earthquake all the microchip companies in Silicon Valley and then win that trade war that he has going. He's going to flood the valley, right? Like, isn't it? It turns out, yeah, he's eventually going to earthquake and therefore flood the valley. Right. Right. Which, again, you really need to understand a lot about geology. (laughs) Regardless, though, it just seems like wouldn't they... Wouldn't they just rebuild the factory or like move it somewhere else? Probably have facilities elsewhere anyway and just keep going as companies. <laughs> yeah, you'd think. You'd think. So it's it's not a long term plan by any means. Well, then he then he just pushes you out of a blimp. Like there's always, okay. a, there's, <laughs> there's always another blimp. It's blimps all the way down here. Fair enough. Yeah. Would you mind having your factory in Chicago step onto this blimp <laughs> for me? No. <laughs> what? Right. So, whatever. We learned something about earthquakes. Stacy and James head to City Hall at this point to check on earthquake stuff at a municipal records closet office. Oh, real quick. They do do that. But while they're doing that, the CIA agent gets killed by Grace Jones in his car. Oh, yeah. Identically to how she kills uh, Tibbet earlier. Yes, exactly. That's why real spies only enter their cars through the trunk, then slowly crawl their way through the back seat, clearing one side of the car at the time. Until they reach the driver's seat. Yeah, all makes sense. Does any of that matter to the plot even slightly, though? No, Yes. not even a little. The murder of the CIA agent? Yeah, why does he matter now? Yes, because later, when he tells the cop he's James Bond, he's like, oh, yeah, can anyone prove that? And he's like, call the CIA agent. And he's like, that guy just got murdered. Okay. Okay, well, that plot point is amazingly wrapped up, and it's going to make sense later. Whatever. They get to this records office, and they open a drawer and immediately pull out the perfect piece of paper that has a map of the evil plan on it. And immediately Zorin and Mayday show up at this city hall records. Why would, why would they go to the records office? How would they know that that would help? Great question. Okay. Again, doesn't matter. They have guns out and they stick up James and Stacy and they have a, a little uh, banter, evil guy banter. Well, yeah, so Bond finds a map in the in the folder that's for all intents and purposes might as well have just been titled the super secret evil plan map. Yep, exactly. Like, there's literally a, an <laughs> right. X marks the spot on the map that says like main target. Like, yeah. <laughs> or like doomsday. <laughs> also confused why they filed their evil plan with City Hall. They were like, hey, um, what kind of permits do we need to blow up Silicon Valley? We're sticklers about zoning boards. Oh, stuff. you're going to want to go downstairs, downstairs to evil plans. Talk to Jerry. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so all we really learn is that this place called Main Strike is actually an old silver mine that Zorin is running, and that mine is right on the San Andreas Fault, and that's going to help his plan. Yeah, and and you find out that the the record, the head of the of the geology department, right, like the head of the geology, you know, department of that that checks everything, the oil and mines guy, right, the oil and mines guy, the permit guy, basically, has been on the take for Zorin this whole time. That's why he fired Blondie Mc, uh, uh, Charlie's Angels Mc, um, um, Donna's mom. Okay, <laughs> got it. So, <laughs> so they walk into that guy's office and they're like, "Hey, we caught these people trying to steal records or something. Go ahead and call the cops." And that's really just part of a really long like riddle speech that Walken was giving to to the mine and oil guy to taunt him, and then he just shoots him anyway, right there. Which, by the way, if you were surprised by how easy it is to get a gun into City Hall, you will be shockingly delighted by how easy it is to fire one in City Hall. Yeah. (laughs) With no alarms or repercussions of any kind, really. And again, because of this movie, its specialization is convoluted bad guy plots. Here is Christopher Walken's plot. Okay. For some reason, I knew they'd be at City Hall. How do I know that? Fuck you. But I know they're here. I hold them at gunpoint. I'm going to escort them into an elevator, murder her ex-boss, 
light his office on fire. Did I bring a bunch of gasoline and Molotov cocktails with me? Of course I did. <laughs> then I'm going to light just the elevator that they are on on fire. And the police will conclude from this that the crime was done by them. The people who burn. Hey, boss, I, I heard you just explain that whole thing. There's You set up a game of mousetrap in the elevator, too. I feel like that was excessive. <laughs> Can't we just shoot them all with guns and just walk out? Why do we even have him call the cops? I feel like now no, we're under time pressure. fire-based crime framing only. Okay. Guys, I have a super subtle plan to conceal our giant terrorist attack that's about to happen. We're going to burn down City Hall. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. So now Bond and Stacy are in the elevator and it's burning because Kazorin threw one of the Molotov cocktails that he brought onto the elevator. It feels like Zorin came up with this idea in like a dorm room. You know <laughs> what I mean? It feels like Zorin came up with this plan, stoned out of his fucking skull at 2 a.m. and was just like, all right, hear me out. Yeah, well, fun fact, the screenwriters did pretty much exactly that. Yeah, yeah, right. that's fair. So they're trapped in the elevator and James Bond, I don't know why they shot this so many times. There's like seven different shots of James Bond touching the ceiling, realizing it's hot and then being like, oh, okay, well, we can't do that. <laughs> Ow, dude, hot. Dude, that's, don't be mean. His memory is not that good at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be fair, he is 80. Right. He should be a congressman, not a spy. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's a confusing moment here too. James finally does sneak out of the top of the elevator somehow and she screams, Stacy screams, don't leave me because that's what he does here. He just leaves her in the burning elevator shaft for a while. He has a plan, but, you know, explain what you're doing. He grabs like a hose and lowers it down and she grabs it and he pulls her out. Okay, but honestly, if James Bond did leave her, that's pretty fucking funny. Just like, I mean, I've got all the information I need from you, Stacy. Bye-bye. Yeah. I'm sorry. I've got so much life left to live. <laughs> Happy 18th birthday. <laughs> right. So they make it to the roof of the building and escape. The fire department's here at this point. James at this point says, all right, climb onto my back. I'm going to fireman carry you down this ladder from this very tall building. And she's like, well, I'm, I'm conscious. I can I'm just conscious. There's absolutely also no reason go down the ladder. But instead, Roger Moore or probably a stunt. Either way, somebody very awkwardly has to go down a ladder with somebody on their back. Yeah, definitely not Roger Moore. And this is where we get, like, the cop shenanigans. So, again, this movie has made no sense. There's no reason for the scene not to end here. But for some reason, he gets to the bottom of the ladder, and then the police are like, you're under arrest. And he's like, what? And they're like, yeah, we need another car chase. So uh, we were thinking maybe you could run away from us, and we could, you know, kill 10 minutes of movie time yeah. by you running away. <laughs> and he tries to get out of being arrested in the absolute dumbest way I've ever seen. He's just like, no, 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 officer, you don't understand. I'm a spy. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like, under the lightest amount of threat, he's like, my name's James Bond, my service <laughs> number is B348, I'm a foreign agent of a foreign government. That's cool with you guys, right? <laughs> oh, I, I did, yes, no, I did technically burn down your city hall, but again, super spy. <laughs> I have a license to burn your <laughs> right. city hall. Now. And the officer is like, is like, I don't know what you're talking about, pal, and he's like, no, 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 don't worry. All you have to do is contact Chuck McGee, a very specific undercover CIA agent who you, this local police chief, obviously has access to. He secretly he works, works at, at Joe's Crab, Crab Shack. Shack under a different <laughs> yeah. name. You'll need to, you need to call them. Do not ask for the soft shells crabs. He will definitely kill you. <laughs> he, will in, he will induct you into the CIA by accident. <laughs> right. You don't know Chuck? I thought everybody knew Chuck. <laughs> but no, they, they don't know that he's a spy instantly. So he <laughs> because steals, he said so. Right. So he steals a fire truck, the most conspicuous vehicle <laughs> possible. First, he uses hose attack, and it is extremely effective. <laughs> he does use hose attack. It's true. Don't forget that. He's like, he's like, I'm a spy. Contact Chuck. The police officer is like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And Bond's like, counterpoint, hose to your face. Counterpoint, yep. I don't have enough time to explain the plot. I don't even know what it is. Fire hose. Run away. Steal fire truck. That's what happens. Yeah. Yes. So he's got a fire truck and all the movie writers thought were like, okay, fire truck, chase, ladder stuff. That's it. And they do ladder stuff. So he's like hanging off the ladder that flies out for a chase scene. That's it. Correction. A guy who looks less like Roger Moore than Susan Boyle does ladder stuff while occasionally <laughs> Roger Moore is seen yeah. holding a steering wheel. 
Dwayne the Rock Johnson is somehow hanging off this ladder. Yeah. Yeah, in a Roger Moore, in a in I wouldn't even call it a Roger Moore wig. It's not even the color of his hair. <laughs> and if you're ever wondering like where the logic for Grand Theft Auto games came from, it's this fucking movie. Yeah. Because this movie operates under the logic that if you evade the cops for three minutes and get out of the hot zone, you just get to keep the fire truck. Like, yeah, right. it's your fire truck now. <laughs> So they get to Zoran's mine the next morning, and it's right on the fault line. So this is where he's going to execute his evil plot. Okay, so just to be clear, this is like the big finale of the bad guy's plot. And James Bond, who the bad guy is aware of, who his henchman is aware of, and now local and state police are aware of, drives onto this mine in a fire truck with a woman, and they're just like, Hey, pal, you need a hard hat. You can't, you know, just want it. Yeah. Right. So they sneak into the mine pretending to be mine people. Now they have hard hats. Stacy steps out of the truck at one point and she's got high heels on from before. And one of the evil miner henchmen people is like, what is it, a lady miner in high heels? And Bond smooths it over by being like feminism, right? I think they literally say women's lib. Yeah. Yep. Says women's lib. And the, the guy's like, yeah, women are the worst. Okay, go ahead. Do whatever you want in our <laughs> evil mind. That's fine. So they dress up again, again. They, now they have like more minor, st- different, more minor stuff on. Mm-hmm. And they sneak into the mine inside a cart. Yeah, filled with explosives, right? Yeah, right. The cart is filled with explosives. And while we're watching them sneak in, there's a bomb at the bottom of the mine that will be the final bomb. But there's also a like a second place bomb that the bad guy sneaks in that's going to kill all the henchmen. Yeah. Oh, the movie forgot about that, though. They like did that and then it didn't matter at all. Yeah. And a- as they're sneaking in on the pot truck full of explosives, Stacy turns to Bond and is like, Bond, look what's under my ass. And he looks and it's like a pound of fucking like high explosives and i just want to point out that in a movie known for its witticisms whoever wrote this is a fucking coward for not having bond make an explosive (laughs) diarrhea joke (laughs) oh just a coward missed opportunity (laughs) coward okay so they make it into the mine it seems there's hundreds of miners everywhere it seems like they would know that they're not mining anything yep but there's some kind of evil plot happening they don't care they're doing it and finally, after it, this, it moves so slowly. Finally, after a long time of just slowly walking around this mine, James and Stacy find Zorin and Mayday setting up the big bomb. And we know that because there's, of course, a countdown display on it. It's set for 36 minutes and go. Yeah. Nothing gets the heart racing like a 36 minute timer. <laughs> yeah, weird pick. Oh, no, we could only watch an episode of Everybody Loves Raymond before we can fucking defuse this one. (laughs) And, like, maybe the first couple of scenes of the next episode. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So, Stacey and Bond are in a little mining shack inside the mine cave area. And Stacey finds another one of those tabletop scale model dioramas of the evil plot this time. It's just... A, a model of the area of California that they're going to blow up and flood or whatever. Yeah. So I love it. some scale model guy crushed it with Zorin as <laughs> like this amazing yeah, it, salesman made so much money. And because he's seen all the models, is he just like back at his shop, just like, I wonder if I should report that to anybody. <laughs> like, I should probably move out of, you know, the coast of California, but uh, I am making a lot of money. <laughs> Look, when you work in scale models, What happens in scale models stays in scale models, all right? (laughs) And this table thing is so silly. It's got like LED lights that flash. It's like an interactive museum exhibit about doing terrorism from 1985. It's so stupid. Just wanted a bored classroom of kids to come through. All right, now this is the terrorist plan to blow up (laughs) the Silicon Valley. (laughs) Right. Which uh, I think we can all agree in the long term, looking back from 2022, probably would have been a better move than letting it stand. Okay. <laughs> okay, I have a question right now. The piece of information we get here is that Zorin is going to flood the San Andreas Fault and do a bomb. Yep. And then they say it's a double earthquake. Stacy says that. She's a geologist. What the fuck does that? What is a double earthquake? Oh, who knows? Who knows? I don't. Who knows why this movie constantly doubles down on its own fake science to make sure we're following along with boom, make California go bye bye. Okay. 
No idea. She also says, this is such a silly detail. She's like, yeah, right below us is the linchpin of plate tectonics in the universe. <laughs> so, so Bond is like, that sounds ridiculous. But are, are you saying he can like just pull the linchpin of plate tectonics with, with the bomb? And Stacy <laughs> Stacy presses a button on the side of the diorama thing. The answer button, I guess. And some lights flash and she's like, yeah, it says, it says, yes, he can change plate tectonics with a bomb in the exact right place. Yeah. Is, is that not the plot? Absolutely. There's a visual aid for the bad guy's plot. His mini guy didn't charge him extra for it. <laughs> okay. So just to be clear, the plan for breaking into the Mike Trip game is destroying the entire coast of California, but also flooding some factories that have microchips and they'll get wet and ruined. Right. Okay. <laughs> so at this moment, they get found by Mayday and Zorin in this little shed and they run away into the mine. So we get a little chase through the mine. Again, they get found for no reason. Again, like literally Grace Jones just decides to check that door and she's like, oh, look, it's the people we tried to kill in the convoluted <laughs> plotter. Get them. Yeah. Right. So they run after him a little bit. James and Stacy find a, a secret room off to the side of the mind it was like donkey kong country they like phase through a fuzzy wall and they're just <laughs> like in, in a different area yeah meanwhile christopher walken and fucking grace jones and jenny the fucking jenny flex are chasing them and my favorite part of this is as they're like chasing them all the like workers start looking and walken just goes get back to work nothing to see just like, like, just super casual. Me and my two beautiful assistants in a gun and karate fight with a British spy and his granddaughter. <laughs> you know, normal sh mining shit. Fucking unions. <laughs> we haven't done anything with metal or ore yet. That's weird, right? Shh. <laughs> Go back to work. Just yeah. keep piling explosives onto the okay. linchpin of the tectonic plate. Got it. Yeah, where's Got that it. spy and his granddaughter? Where'd they go? <laughs> karate. <laughs> right. So at this point... Stacy and James get to a ventilation shaft with a ladder and they're going to climb out of the mine to escape. And we also see Zorin. He, he's executing the end of the plot now. He's just going to blow up the whole thing with all the miners inside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, step three in all good evil plans is murder your entire staff. Sure. <laughs> I, I guess that part does make sense. So he blows up one of the secondary bombs at this point that starts the flooding of all the water onto the fault line as, mm -hmm. you know, the first part of the double earthquake flood he's doing. Yeah, exactly. And then he starts shooting all the miners who try to run. Like, <laughs> they're down in the pit. And he's up, like, a couple of stairs. A bunch of flooding's happening, and he's shooting them all with a gun. And podcast listener, we will not make you suffer through how long this shooting people with a machine gun scene is. Suffice it to say that... He runs out of evil laughter and just <laughs> boredly shoots guys for a solid extra two minutes in total stone face. He's like, ha, 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 grr, grr, ha, ha, grr, grr. And he's like, God, we hired a lot of people. I mean, Christopher Walken <laughs> ran out of evil laughing. Think Jesus. about that. <laughs> yeah. God. <laughs> Do you guys all mind lining up? This is taking forever. This movie is painfully slow and boring, and I, who am in it, am no longer having a good time. Right, so we get forever of that gunshot thing. And then we see Stacy climbing out of the ventilation shaft. She made it just above the waterline, just in time. But James and Mayday, who was following, they both get swept away by the water. Yeah. And then Zorin and his security guy drive out of the mine in a little mine scooter together and we see the entire lake that was above them it's fully empty now we see a fisherman who just like his boat dropped from water level straight down to the grid there's no in 30 seconds the entire like lake ta whatever it was lake is is empty yes so then we get bond and mayday popping out of the water inside of one of the tunnels but the level's rising and there's just enough room for their faces and we also see zorin going to some other building to do i guess to do the second part of the double earthquake he's going to Activate it from there. Right. But but Grace Jones is like hurt by the fact that he would do the second part of the earthquake without her. So now she's a good guy. She's on Bond's side. To be clear, there are four seconds left in this <laughs> fucking movie. And Grace Jones, the main villain, the henchman of the evil villain of this movie is like, 
Well, I didn't realize he was going to take off without me. I'm on your side now, James Bond. Let's deactivate this bomb together. <laughs> yep. Also, we learn here that that little building they go to, to do the second part, Zorin's put together a blimp building. The building is also a blimp. It turns into a blimp at this point, and he's going to fly away. A secret blimp. Yes. Why would that need to be a it's building? A super why, why would it need blimp. to be? Just have a blimp <laughs> or a helicopter. Because, dude, it was the eight. Were blimps big in the eighties? <laughs> is that a thing I missed? Like, <laughs> I feel like much as this movie was trying to introduce us to snowboarding, it was also trying to make blimps a thing. Like, they bought a bunch of stock and blimps, and they're like, "You'll see, everyone's gonna want a blimp after they get their eyes on this film." <laughs> Everything in this movie is a blimp. The buildings are blimps. The cars are blimps. Rob Rayner's a blimp. Everything, <laughs> everything in this film becomes a blimp. <laughs> also, and again, like, we won't bore you with it. It's so fucking slow and boring. We watch a blimp fully inflate as part of the stakes of this movie. Do you have any fucking idea how long it takes a blimp to it? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, it's not even like a third of the way you're there yet. <laughs> and once and once they're finally airbound, we get a scene of inside the cockpit with Zorin and the fucking Nazi doctor. And then they point out that like this is the perfect crime because Scientists are going to blame all that. They're going to blame this on a normal emptying of lakes that causes a double earthquake and they're going to ignore the giant bombs and they're never going to investigate. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, if you're wondering what James Bond and Grace Jones are doing, that could be possibly more boring than watching a <laughs> blimp inflate. We're watching James Bond get ever so slowly winched down to the second bomb oh, yeah. by yeah. Grace is it, Jones. Is it an electric winch that moves kind of quickly or is it a hand mm, crank? No, it is a hand crank. It's a hand crank. 89% of this movie is Grace Jones pushing or pulling things. <laughs> I can name like a wide variety, the car, yep. the fucking winch, like the man. Like <laughs> I honestly think the people who made this movie saw Grace Jones she was the first in shape human being they'd ever seen. And they were like, you got to watch her do a jumping jack, man. It's going to be the whole <laughs> film. I think the way this film was written is they put Grace Jones in just a room and they were just like, pick up that. <laughs> All right, that can work. Like, you know, what? improvise, improvise, improvise. Could you do a chin up? She can do a chin up, guys. Look at her. She's smacking it. That is incredible. Yes. <laughs> so we watch Bond get slowly lowered into the pit. He grabs the bomb, puts it on the winch thing, slowly pulled back up by hand by Grace Jones. It's so long. We watch the whole thing. Again, I it's cannot so emphasize long. how much of this we watch with absolutely zero tension. The actors are bored. The music's at a certain point, the music, which is like bum bum bum, and the music's like bum 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 bum. Yeah. Bum, bum. At one point, they, they show us Stacy. She's fine. She made it. She climbed out of the mine and they show her not really having anything to do. We just see her like out there. She's like, all right, well, I guess I guess I'm I'm out of this plot now. And then we're back down in the mine. There's a minute left on the bomb. You ever leave a restaurant and like everyone else and the wives all go in to use the bathroom. So you just sort of stand out there for a bit, slapping your thighs to a rhythm only you can hear. <laughs> we get a nice three minutes of Stacy doing that. <laughs> If you like pina coladas, in a minute, I'm going to need a little bit of... wonder how that bomb's going down there. Oh, well, I don't know. I'm going to go to Wendy's. Yeah. So that happens. Then we're back in the mine. And the plan, James and Mayday, they're going to roll away the bomb on a cart, on a mine cart on the track. Mm -hmm. So they got it out of the pit. They put it on a cart. And they're going to roll it out on the track. And this, this is my favorite part of the movie. <laughs> they start the thing rolling. Of course, Grace Jones pushes the thing <laughs> and then it just stops almost right away and they're like fuck the brake lever the brake lever, lever kicked in and it stopped it from rolling yep i couldn't stop laughing yeah we have to we have to watch grace <laughs> jones half jog over to the mine cart and be like i, I guess i'll stay on the mine cart i don't know right yeah <laughs> the the most dramatic device in this entire film is a poorly greased brake yeah, yeah. It's like what you ever try to sled a fat kid and physics isn't with you. That's the climax of this movie. <laughs> so good. I, I seriously had to stop. I laughed for like 20 minutes just by myself in my apartment because they had to go move a lever to fix this. <laughs> but I guess the plot device here is that Mayday now has to stay on the cart and hold the brake from activating and sacrifice herself with the bomb. 
so that happens. They, they roll out and the bomb goes off, but the cart was just, you know, it was a few feet outside of the linchpin of plate tectonics in the world. So it's fine. Just, yeah. just goes off. To be clear, the most heroic person in the movie is the bad guy's henchman. James Bond saw that the break wasn't going to work and he was like, oh, I guess we're all fucked then. <laughs> right. And then, okay, I laughed a lot at this too. We go back to Stacy for a second. She's above ground now. And right. she's like, oh, hey, I was about to go to Wendy's, but it's good. You made it out. And as this is happening, the blimp is sneaking up behind sneaks her. Sneaks up behind her. Stealth blimp. A blimp sneaks up behind her and they grab her off the ground and fly away with her. <laughs> and Bond grabs onto the blimp rope that all blimps have. I guess they always have a dangling rope. And now he's just dangling off a flying blimp that's going, yeah. well, blimp speed. I would be genuinely shocked if Roger Moore can climb a flight of stairs, let alone hold on to a swinging <laughs> blimp rope. Oh, the, the amount of blimp that they can show Roger Moore interacting in this movie is deeply pathetic. Like, they don't even have a shot of him on the ladder. It's just his upper half of his body gently holding on to a rope, and they're like, okay, we'll, we'll do stunts for the rest, I guess, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> and so the plan here, they're driving the blimp, and they're like, oh, James Bond's on the rope. What we'll do is slam him into the Golden Gate Bridge, like the high parts of it, but, you know, really slow because they're in a fucking blimp. So nothing happens. They they run over the bridge. Yeah, they gently set him upon the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. And Bond very gently is like, I'm pressed against this thing. Okay. I have plenty of time to think of what to do. And he plan, his plan is he ties a really good fucking Boy Scout knot using that rope, thus tying the blimp to the bridge and the blimp can't move. That's right, audience member. The finale of the finale is a well-tied Boy Scout knot. Yes, and now the action has slowed down from blimp speed to literally no speed. There's no motion. <laughs> it's tied. Yeah. We are now watching a tied balloon for the finale of this movie. <laughs> so, right, so they try to turn the blimp around now because they think, you know, knots only operate in one direction. I'm not sure what they thought they were doing. They try to turn the blimp. Like, we might as well be watching Walk-In try to parallel park to somehow end the movie in multiple cuts. I wrote cuts. in my notes, we might as well be watching me try to back into a parking spot. <laughs> <laughs> so, finally, a little bit of action does happen here. Stacy decides to attack Walk-In and the Nazi doctor. And at this point, Bond climbs up the bridge structure to the blimp to rescue Stacy. Right. But Walken jumps out of the blimp with an axe to have an axe fight. Okay. But like, Roger Moore is 97 years old. Christopher Walken's like, fuck that. I'm not doing any fight choreography. So they just have like a little shoving match. Yeah. They wrestle over the axe. <laughs> it's so bad. You ever like rough house with your buddy but you're both too old and in too nice yeah. clothing to really roughhouse. <laughs> That's the finale of this film. And while they're doing this, Stacy is literally holding on for dear life because a few seconds ago when she was getting out of the blimp, Bond was like, jump! And she was like, I don't want to. And he's like, it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he pushes Zoran off the thing and Zoran's like, ha ha, I lose. And as a result, his Nazi dad, this is how lazy this fucking movie is. He goes, you know how all blimps have a cartoon bunch of dynamite in their med kit in the back? The, yeah, the, the dynamite area. It's next to the champagne room usually and, right, the, and yeah, the slippery exactly. ramp. Hey guys, are we, uh, are we stocked for this blimp ride? Everybody have water, sex, dynamite? Yep, Everybody? Got it. <laughs> yeah. He runs back, <laughs> grabs the dynamite, lights it. And immediately drops it. He's like, all right, the dynamite. Sorry, what is my plan at this point? And the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Bond, Bond like gently tugs the rope. But because it's a blimp, the guy's just like, Ugh! because <laughs> say what you want. But this movie does have like a continuous theme, which is vaudeville pratfalls. It's true. Absolutely. It's true. <laughs> so yeah, Nazi doctor like falls back into the blimp and he's got the dynamite that runs out. The fuse runs out. It blows up. The blimp with him in it. My one favorite part of this, though, is they show us the Golden Gate Bridge again right at this point, And we watch San Francisco traffic just ignoring everything that's happening and driving across the bridge. They're like, yeah, 
gotta, gotta get home from work. So <laughs> everybody goes home. I'm not letting a fucking blimp interrupt my commute, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right. And then we finally close out this stupid fucking movie with James Bond getting an award from the KGB for his heroics. You know, like that thing they did. <laughs> you know, that thing where the KGB gave British spies medals. <laughs> right. I guess that's a thing. Yeah. And they sort of do a wink about it. They're like, oh, you're the first British spy to get the medal. Huh? And, and then and then he's and then M is like, I would have thought you'd have, you know, you'd have been glad to see Silicon Valley, you know, blown to smithereens. And the Russian guy's like, then where would we get all our research? And then they all have a good jovial laugh at the geopolitical corruption yeah. of American capitalism. <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to totally hack one of your elections using computer stuff. Don't, don't, don't worry. This is good for us. This is good for us. Yeah. <laughs> you guys invent Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> we also find out that Bond is missing in action at this point, as far as they know. But then we cut to Q. And Q is sending his remote control car. Remember from before? He's sending it into Stacy's really nice house in California that he's been staking out. And he, he's going to spy on James and Stacy having a sexy shower together. I would like to clarify one thing, which is that this scene quite genuinely opens on the word pussy. Just yep. right there in fucking center view. Like, that is the first shot of this fucking scene is just the word pussy yeah. because this movie couldn't get less subtle if it shot you in the <laughs> face with a shotgun. But yeah, he drives his cart in and we see them canoodling in the shower and Bond throws his towel over it like, you get it? Because she's almost 18. <laughs> the end. God. <laughs> all right. I'd normally ask you the moral of the story, but I think the answer that we all know is every Don't 80s movie... Don't let Moishi pick the movies. <laughs> uh, that and every 80s movie has to end with a sex crime. But, uh, you know, only a little bit and then they stop it, so... Woke. Don't give Jews the smart pills. <laughs> right. Was that my, that was okay. my moral. Oh, no. We, we, had, we had plenty of morals. Good. I learned a lot today. Good point. Good point. All right. Well, that is going to do it for our review of A View to a Kill. But that's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we found another terrible movie for next week. So, Eli, what's on deck? Well, this one was a special request from our very own Michael Marshall. We'll be doing the Nicolas Cage film Knowing. <laughs> Fantastic. We got Cage next week. All right. With that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 355 to a merciful close. Huge thanks to Moishi for joining us. Much appreciated. Thank you. And of course, a big thanks to our Patreon donors for all the generosity. If you'd like to help support the show, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful, and that'll get you early access to an ad-free version of every episode. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Needed, The Skeptocrat, and D&D Minus, available in all the podcast places. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for the podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of the Eagle Giraffes on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Moishi and Eli, I'm Heath, promising to work hard, turn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Animal House close. Roger Moore would go on to describe this movie as the biggest mistake of his career. <laughs> Christopher Walken would go on to describe this movie as the biggest the mistake thing. of Roger Moore's career. <laughs> oh, even better. <laughs> That's pretty fucking good. The Zorin Company went on to keep doing just fine because the CEO of the company mostly doesn't matter. The Q Robot would later go on to star in several porn parodies of the movie Wall-E. <laughs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved. We want students to know that if they go to Kent State, they have the world a la carte as an opportunity for them to develop a true global perspective.